Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's program is a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Kidney Transplant Program. Before we get started, I just want to go a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you're in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so you can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-host and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have any personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next, I would like to introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Joining us today, we have Dr. Leonardo Riella. Dr. Riella is the Harold and Ellen Danzer Endowed Chair in Transplantation an Associate Professor of Medicine at Mass General Harvard Medical School. He is the Medical Director of Kidney Transplantation and the Senior Investigator at the Center of Transplantation Sciences. Dr. Riella sees kidney patients both pre- and post-transplantation. In celebration of National Donor Day, he joins us today to give a talk on kidney disease, transplantation, and innovations at Mass General. So please join me in welcome Dr. Riella. Thank you so much, Amy, for the opportunity uh, and for, for all, all the attendees uh, for joining me for the next 30, 45 minutes uh, to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is, which is kidney disease and how can we uh, prevent kidney disease and treat kidney disease. So we decided to, to make uh, this session uh, very practical, so bring up uh, some tips as well as we try to understand better uh, what is the role of the kidney. And I had a few items that I want to make sure I touch uh, through uh, the next 30 minutes. So first of all, just talking about what do the kidneys do? What are the causes of kidney disease and some of the treatments that are available? Five tips for keeping your kidneys healthy. And what are some of the recent innovations in kidney research um, that uh, are important for patients to know about? And I'll start with a very basic principle and, and something that I feel that often we forget about. So if we look at our body, our body is made of 70% of water, which is essential for survival. So, and this is important because we can live for weeks without food, but we cannot live more than a few days without water. And water, you know, it carries all the nutrients to all the different parts of the body. And also this water uh, has a very tightly controlled concentration of salts and minerals. And these are very important because if you get uh, significant changes in the concentration of some of these salts and minerals, uh, you may have significant uh, complications health-wise. And if you ask me which organ controls and senses this balance of water and minerals in the body, and that the uh, this organ is are, are the kidneys. So the kidneys are, are two bean-shaped organs located on your back. And what they do is that they are composed of about a million very tiny filters, which we call glomeruli. And you can see here on the right side, this little uh, tiny filters that have very small blood vessels. And this is where your blood uh, flows through and gets filtered. Not only that, it also has this pipe structure, the tubules that basically are capable of reabsorbing all the good stuff that got filtered and secrete any toxins and other metabolites that your body produce so that it gets finally excreted in the urine. So this delicate process, it's not the only, um, the only function of the kidney, but the kidney has a, as a central role to really clean, clean the waste and extra fluid from your blood. And to give you an idea of how effective this is, the kidneys filter about 180 liter, liters of blood a day. So that's about 50 gallons of blood is filtered daily but we only produce about a liter or two of urine a day. So it's an extremely efficient system um, from, the, from the filtrate that it happens to the urine 
there's a lot of process ongoing that allows us to minimize the amount of uh, water that we excrete in the urine, uh, concentrated with toxins and things that our body does not need. The kidney is not only important for that, for the excretion of the extra water, but it tightly regulates a number of very important minerals, phosphate, calcium, magnesium, potassium. It also functions as a gland and secrete hormones that tightly regulate your blood pressure, also make you produce red blood cells, preventing you from having anemia, and also activate vitamin D in order for your bones to stay healthy. So the kidney is not only a filter, but it has all these other functions that are essential for our, for our health. And this is why it is, uh, these two uh, beans are so incredible. Uh, what about kidney disease? So when we talk about kidney disease, it means that the kidneys have suffered some permanent damage. And what's very surprising to many people is that one in every 10 individuals have kidney disease. And the problem is that many of them actually don't know they have kidney disease because it tends to be a silent disease, a, a disease that it takes uh, many uh, damage to the kidney happening over and over again for finally patients to have symptoms. And there are multiple causes of kidney disease and certain risk factors. For example, diabetes and high blood pressure are one of the leading causes of kidney disease. But there are other causes as well that can potentially damage the kidney, such as autoimmune disease, some genetic susceptibilities that the patient may be born with, infections, and this we had seen with the COVID uh, pandemic when patients had a very severe uh, COVID infections, the kidney got affected, and also certain medications. So there are patients that take a lot of ibuprofen, Motrin, what we call non-steroid or anti-inflammatory agents, and these drugs can actually cause damage the kidney. Uh, so why is this such an important thing for, for you as a patient to know? And this is mostly because majority of the patients uh, develop kidney disease and progression of kidney disease, and they don't know about it until it's too late. And this is why we call it a silent disease. So next time you see your physician, it is very important that you ask them, how, is your, how are your kidneys working? And it's a very easy way to, to check for that. So there's a simple blood test called creatinine. Uh, and this creatinine is, is a product, byproduct of the muscles that's filtering the kidney and release uh, in the urine. So when you uh, measure the concentration of that creatinine and you are able to calculate and usually comes out already on your blood work, uh, what we say is the GFR or glomerular filtration rate. That's an estimation of how your kidneys are filtering. And here I have this diagram showing that majority of patients would have a GFR between 80 and 120. And once you have a GFR below 60, this is when we start defining kidney disease, all the way when it's below 15 that we define as kidney failure. What's important here is that majority of the patients say with a kidney function of GFR of 45 and above, they may not have any symptoms. And they really start having symptoms only where when this number gets below or close to 15. We also do a second test in the urine to make sure that there's no protein or cells in the urine. And this is also an indicator how good the filters are. So if there's damage in the filter, the patient may start leaking protein or sometimes leaking cells into the urine. And this is another indicator there might be a problem. So with just a blood test and a urine test, we can tell you about your kidney health. Once the disease progresses and, and once your GFR, which is this estimate of kidney function gets, gets close to 25 or below, this is when we start thinking about transplantation. But before we go that, let's step back and talk about what are some of the common symptoms of kidney disease. And again, this only happens when the kidney disease is very advanced, but they're very vague symptoms, so not very specific to the kidney. So you may, may feel more fatigue or feeling weak. You may have a difficulty concentrating, some confusion. Your sleep may not be great. You may have a metallic taste in your mouth, loss of appetite, nausea and vomiting, reduced uh, urine production, swollen ankles, or sometimes muscle cramps. And this, again, are symptoms that happen uh, as the kidney disease gets very advanced and as your body starts accumulating a lot of toxins that the kidney usually handles and eliminates from your body. But once it starts accumulating, you start getting all these uh, uh, potential symptoms. So what do we do to treat kidney disease? So the first thing is really to understand what's causing the kidney disease. As, as I told you, high blood pressure and high blood sugar are one of the leading causes. So we need to first get that under control. 
But there are other causes, such as autoimmune disease, that may require an immune, immune suppression medication, medication that may weaken the immune system, and so forth. So knowing it's super important in order for us to be able to treat it accordingly to what's the cause. The second thing is that more recently, there has been a number of new medications that have been established to slow down the kidney disease progression. Some older ones, such as the ACE inhibitors are used, and some of the newer ones, such as SGLT2 inhibitors, may be indicated in some specific cases. And finally, if you know that you have kidney disease, you're also going to be avoiding medications that may cause further damage to the kidney. And I, as an example, what I just told you before are the non-steroid or anti-inflammatory agents, ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, and these medications, we do not want to take a lot of those because they can definitely uh, 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 contribute to more kidney disease. As the dis kidney disease progresses, you may get to what we call kidney failure or end-stage kidney disease. And this is when a patient's kidney function is no longer adequate to maintain life. And the problem is that, you know, unfortunately, we have to, patients start feeling really poorly at that stage. And in the U.S., there are close to 740,000 patients who have end-stage kidney disease. So what are the treatment options once you start getting to that more advanced stage of kidney failure? So the number one option, and usually the best option for good candidates, is kidney transplantation. And we'll dive into some of the um, uh, nuances and importance of that. Another treatment is uh, dialysis. And there are two forms of dialysis uh, that basically are gonna filter your blood artificially in order for you to remove some of the toxins that may accumulate in kidney disease. And finally, there's also the option of doing conservative treatments. So this consists in changing the diet using medications. And, and it, it's uh, in particular uh, useful for patients that may have a limited type uh, life expectancy, or may have other diseases that may prevent them from doing either transplantation or dialysis. And what's important as well is, as you think about your treatment options, that you have to start planning things really ahead, because it takes time to get all the different steps necessary for you uh, to get enrolled in, in one of these treatment options. Let's start with dialysis. So dialysis is a treatment that's kind of removing waste and extra fluids from your body, and there are two uh, uh, different strategies. One is called hemodialysis, which is a, a machine that removes blood from your body, filters in a, in a very tiny kind of capillary loop of capillaries, and then gets you back you know, clean blood at, blood at the end. It is something that tends to be done at a, at a dialysis center. So you go to a facility three times a week for about four hours. And, uh, and this tries to control that waste product and the extra fluid. There's another treatment that tends to be done mostly at home. It's called peritoneal dialysis. And this is where we're gonna use your own body as the filtering membrane. So you, you infuse a solution inside your abdomen. And then because there's a membrane that allows some molecules to pass it through, you are able to remove some of these toxins from your blood into this fluid, and then you drain this fluid. Majority of patients use this at night. They just connect a night before going to sleep and they leave a catheter in here. And this way they're able to clean up the blood daily and night. The problem about uh, both uh, types of dialysis is that they only provide about 10% of a normal kidney function. So they're able to, to keep you going and minimize some of the major complications such as accumulation of potassium and, and, and phosphate. But unfortunately, they're not able to fully provide an, a normal kidney function for you. So a lot of patients may still feel tired, fatigue, and not uh, the same cognition that they may have once they, uh, when they do not have uh, kidney disease. And not only that, if you compare dialysis to transplantation, and here I'm giving an example of a 60-year-old gentleman who started dialysis six months before, and he's kind of asking, okay, what is my chances of surviving dialysis compared to transplantation? And what you can see here is that one in every three patients may not be uh, alive after three years on dialysis versus only 5%, five out of 100 patients may be uh, uh, dying after three years. So there is a significant higher risk of dying uh, when a patient remains on dialysis compared to transplantation. And this risk tends to be even higher than certain cancers. So 
what is kidney transplantation and why do we feel is the best treatment options for many of our patients with end-stage kidney disease? So kidney transplantation is an operation that removes a healthy kidney from another person into your body. Ideally, you want to do it in a center that has a high volume. And the reason is that you want surgeons that are doing this, you know, well, uh, every other day or every day so that they are experienced and they have a large team that uh, has managed many of these patients. Second, we consider transplantation a treatment, not a cure. And the reason for that is that once the patients get one of these kidney transplants, they will require lifelong medications to prevent your body from rejecting these kidneys. Uh, it, medications that are going to weaken your immune system and allow you to do not, not reject uh, the transplanted kidney. The success rate for kidney transplantation is incredible. It's about 90 to 95% in one year. And, and uh, MGH is actually a 60th anniversary of the first kidney transplant is this year, 2023. So the first um, kidney transplant that was done at Mass General was in 1963. So we're really excited about uh, this major uh, milestone of our program. What about complications post-transplant? There is a higher risk of infections and cancers, in part related to this weakened immune system that we create by using these anti-rejection medications. There's also a higher risk of developing diabetes post-transplant. So why would a patient choose transplant versus dialysis? Generally, in transplantation, you live longer and better compared to dialysis. You have a greater independence, ability to work, and fewer dietary and travel restrictions. But transplantation is not for everyone. So, so for someone to undergo a big surgery like transplant, they have to be healthy and able to tolerate uh, the surgery. They cannot have any life-threatening health problems that may put them at a higher risk of dying as they go through the procedure. They cannot have an active infection or a cancer that still needs treatment or any drug abuse. And they have to have a, a nice support system around themselves in order for them to, uh, to be able to go through the initial few weeks of recovery and all the new medications and potential side effects that may happen with transplantation. At MGH, we don't have an age limit in the sense that we assess every patient individually and we define uh, if, there is, uh, if there's any limitation and what, what are the risk benefits for transplantation. And we have transplanted patients up to 80 years old. So when uh, does a patient usually requires a transplant? And this is a, a difficult decision because it takes into account a number of different factors. Number one, how is the patient feeling? So if, it, if the patient's quality of life starts to get affected because of kidney disease, these are uh, clear indications to move forward with transplant. We also look at symptoms such as swelling, shortness of breath, or high potassium that cannot improve with just medical treatment. And in general, we can say that the majority of patients will get transplanted when the GFR is close to 15, between 10 and 15, some between 15 and 20, and it really depends on their blood work and how they're feeling overall. Who is the best person to help you with that? So the kidney doctor, what we call a nephrologist, is the best person to judge how your kidneys are doing and defining and helping you navigate through next steps, as well as de defining the, the exact timing that you benefit the most uh, from kidney transplantation. And if we think about transplantation, there's also two options. You can get a deceased donor, and this is um, a, a donor that passed away because of mostly brain death, uh, because of a trauma, for example. And the problem with these kidneys is that uh, you have to wait on a waiting list that may take uh, a number of different years according to your blood group. The waiting time goes between two and six years, majority of cases around four to six years. The best option for the majority of patients is doing a living donor. So this is when a relative, a family member, a friend donates a kidney. And this way you can avoid dialysis and get transplanted right away. We always talk about dialysis as being a bridge. We wanna stay on that bridge the closest time possible and getting the transplants and avoiding time on dialysis uh, helps you a lot in terms of staying healthy. Uh, the risk of rejection is lower when you get a living donor and these kidneys from a living donor tend to last longer. So in general, this is the, the, the best strategy for many patients with advanced kidney disease. For those that don't have a, a living donor, they can definitely enroll on the waiting list and wait until they get to the top 
uh, to get an offer, but this may take a, quite a few years. And sometimes the candidacy or how good a, uh, the risk benefit of transplantation may change over time. So we went over uh, what the kidney do, kidney disease, some of the treatment options, but let's talk now about tips to keep your kidney healthy. And let's start with the first one, drink more water. I just told you that our body is 60% water. And a lot of times we don't drink enough, or actually most of the times we don't drink enough. So it's really important to stay hydrated. The amount of fluid that you drink will depend, of course, on your weight, on the weather that's around, if you're exercising or not. But in general, around two and a half liters per day is what's recommended. Um, and with variation uh, according to, uh, to some of these differences. Uh, there's no good way deciding uh, how much fluid to drink, but you can definitely look at your urine and see if it's clear or if it's yellow or dark yellow, because that can tell us if, you're gonna, if you need to drink more in order to stay hydrated. There is a caveat. So patients with advanced heart disease or kidney disease, they may be advised to ingest less water. So please discuss with your treating physician about it but we, want, we definitely wanna drink more. The, along the same lines of drinking, we, we often wake up and we go straight to our coffee, uh, which you know, it, it's, it, for many people, it's something essential. The problem is that after sleeping, you've been probably close to 12 hours without drinking any water. And the big advice that I'll give you is that you should wake up in the morning and drink a large glass of water. You can squeeze some lemon, lime, just to get the taste out. But this is really important because you want to hydrate your body. Uh, you, I would also recommend you to carry a bottle of uh, water, whatever you go, so you can keep track and keep zipping the water throughout the day. And if you drink alcohol, for example, a glass of wine, you have to, to drink then two extra glasses of water for every glass of wine, hopefully not many. But why is this important? Because both alcohol and coffee are diuretics. They make you pee more. They make you actually lose water. Uh, by inhibiting the production of a hormone called vasopressin, so they, which plays a major role in water excretion. So whenever you're drinking coffee, you may have seen it that you tend to go to the, the bathroom more often and similarly with alcohol. So you have to hydrate more in those scenarios. So that's why I recommend early in the morning, drink the water first and then go to your coffee. The second thing that's really important that can clearly overwhelm the kidneys is the salts. So eat less salt. Uh, so when you eat a, a meal that's full of salt, you're overloading your kidneys because they have to get rid of, of that extra water and salt. That can raise your blood pressure. It can cause swelling and ultimately can you know, back up and uh, cause accumulation of fluid in your lungs and, um, and, and, and cause problems with your heart. So it's really important to try to minimize the amount of salt that you eat in your diet so you can you know, prevent any kidney problems and also uh, lower your risk of heart disease. The second part is that salt is not only important for fluid retention, but we have clear evidence that high salt diet may actually activate your immune system and downregulate, suppress the regulatory immune cells of your immune system. So salt has uh, not only an effect in terms of you know, total volume and retention and swelling, but it can directly affect your immune system. So what are ways for you to reduce the, the amount of salt that you eat in your diet? So number one, don't add salt when you're cooking. So ideally you wanna to try to avoid you know, soy sauce that contains a lot of salt or those stock cubes. What you can do is add, get extra flavor from herbs, spices, or from season, seasoning such as pepper, ginger, lemon, or lime juice. Table sauces like ketchup, mustard, or any of the canned foods, they can contain a lot of salt. In part, they're used for preservation, but, but it, it definitely causes, can cause a huge load of salt that many people don't know about. So check the label, choose low salt options when available. If you're eating out, ask for your meal if it can be made with less salt. And we know that when eating out, this is one of the major loads of, of salts that many of our patients have. When you eat bread and breakfast cereals, they can also contain a lot of salt. So check the labels, compare brands. If you eat smoked meats or packaged meat, hams and so forth, they also contain a lot of salt. So try to avoid this, uh, those if you can. Use a small amount of low sodium salt substitute in the plate instead of doing cooking. So if you throw in the plate, 
you can get the, the salt taste and you don't need as much as if you cook for the entire uh, meal that you're preparing. And just be patient because, you know, salt preference is actually an acquired taste and it can take up to eight weeks to kind of unlearn that salty taste. But I'll guarantee that after that time, you know, you're going to feel comfortable eating uh, food with much less salt. The third tip, tip is about eating less animal protein and more plant-based diet. And I'll tell you why. So when you eat animal protein, uh, the, the animal protein is broken down. And then the kidneys are the ones responsible for getting rid of the toxins that get produced, as well as all the acid that gets produced when you eat the animal fat. So it's really important for patients, in particular with kidney disease, to minimize the amount of animal protein that they take. And this allows uh, them to you know, uh, inhibit some of the, the progression of that kidney disease. So eat animal protein with moderation. Or better than that, use different sources of protein. And here I have some examples, such as uh, the ones coming from fish, like tuna, salmon, or, or chicken, or you use some cooked beans or lentils as a good source, um, as well as nuts. Uh, one caveat, again, about this is that if you have advanced kidney disease, there might be some restrictions of some of these foods. Please talk to your, your doctor. But the, the overall message is that you want to avoid animal uh, protein and move more towards um, plant-based proteins. And if you can, cook more at home and plan your meals ahead. I think the Mediterranean diet in general is a great advice. And you may also join one of the prior sessions from the Bloom um, Learning Center about the MIND diet, which also carries the idea of you know, eating more of these kind of plant-based and colorful rainbow plates, rain rainbow color plates, and avoid processed foods as much as you can and avoid adding sugar and salt uh, to your food. The fourth tip is about exercise. So exercise is an essential part to prevent kidney disease. So four to five times a week is what we recommend between 20 to 30 minutes. Minutes. And the reason why physical activity is so important for the kidneys is that it helps keep your heart and blood vessels healthy. And remember the, the kidney in part is a filter. So it requires very good blood flow and it requires your blood vessels to be healthy in order to fully functional. Function. So you have to um, uh, try to do as much as possible physical activity. Three times a day, you may use some cardio. Two twi twice a day, you, twice a week, you may use some uh, strength training. And that combination uh, provides you the best uh, outcome that we can in terms of your heart and blood vessels, as well as the kidney indirectly. And the fifth tip is avoid gaining weight. And, and this is a, a major issue with kidney disease now because. Uh, overweight patients may develop diabetes, what we call type 2 diabetes, and that's one of the leading causes of kidney disease. So the only way for us to halt that is to measure our weight regularly and take action. If you're seeing your weight coming up, try to uh, intervene right away. And there are a few tips about it. So one is, you know, reduce your portion sizes on your meals. So instead of having that big plate, take a smaller plate you, uh, and that's, that's a, a, a very good tip. Second, if you ate too much uh, on a party the night before, the next morning, fast. Do the 16-hour fasting. This is super important to kind of balance out your calories. Just remember that when you're fasting, you got to stay hydrated. You actually have to drink more than if you're eating. And the drinking of water or tea can actually, you know, minimize some of the hunger that you may have and compensate because our body, you know, has a lot of reserve of sugar and other things to keep you going. So they definitely need that water, but the, um, the food intake is not as necessary for the short term. So those are the five tips that I wanted to, to share with you. And I'll finalize uh, with uh, three, four slides about some of the kidney innovations uh, ongoing at, at MGH. So uh, MGB in general is, is the number one hospital in medical research in the country. And it's, it's an amazing opportunity to, to be working with not only great clinicians, but also researchers that bring the innovation uh, to the bedside. Let me bring you just a few of these innovations that we have incorporated uh, into our practices. So in, in the old days, you would go to your doctor and you would use a stethoscope to listen to your heart, listen to your lungs. But you know, as a kidney doctor, we always felt frustrated because we could, we could look at the urine, but other than that, we can never, we would not, not look at the kidney. And now we have bedside ultrasounds that we use in our kidney clinics, and we can actually look at the kidney 
look at the perfusion of the kidney, look at if there's any stones or any obstruction or anything that may um, affect uh, the kidney function. So this kidney imaging is a reality now that we can apply in our clinic when we're seeing the patients. And, and this is a major advance uh, if we compare to before. The second innovation that I'll point out in terms of kidney disease is the performance of genetic testing. So as I told you before, uh, there are many causes of kidney disease, but there is a subset of cases where there's a genetic predisposition for kidney disease. And this is important because if you know what type of kidney disease and what's the gene involved, they may guide potential treatments. And, and for example, in African-Americans, we know they have a much higher rate of kidney disease um, than, than whites um, and, uh, and other, other ethnicities. And we know now that actually a big portion of these patients have genetic susceptibility in a gene called APOL1. So at MGH, we have a dedicated kit clinic to assess uh, genetic predisposition for kidney disease. And in our transplant evaluation clinic, for selected patients at the time, just before they're doing their evaluation process, we can run genetic testing to define the risk of recurrence of disease and also help with donor selection. So genetic testing is a reality now, not only in research, but in the clinic and may help guide a selected group of patients in order for us to understand better what's going on. And this is in particularly important for patients that don't have a cause of kidney disease that unfortunately uh, came to their doctor and found out they have really advanced kidney disease. And, and this genetic testing helps guide and look for potential explanations. It's not you know, a test that will find all the explanations, but in about one third of our selected patients, we are able to actually find something that may explain why they develop the kidney disease. Uh, talking about disparity, unfortunately, kidney disease affects a tremendous uh, amount of our underserved population. And so about a year ago, we, we launched the Equity in Kidney Transplant Initiative. So this is an initiative that we go to the community, to primary care centers, to health centers, and we talk about kidney disease. We have a clinic uh, devoted to seeing these patients in the community. It's bilingual, Spanish, English, and we also do some virtual group visits to work on education. And we have a number of different resources to help these patients throughout their tr transplant journey, from transportation to insurance expansions and so forth. So this is something that uh, I'm really proud that our program was able to put together with the support of MGH uh, leadership to really try to make things more equitable across um, all the different um, populations that we see uh, in the transplant clinic. And then last of all, uh, the research is a, is a major part of what we do. So if you're coming to MGH, you're not only gonna get excellent clinical care, but there are a number of different research opportunities that you may get involved with. So during COVID, we had a lot of uh, research looking at vaccines risk and, and, and response rate. We also had some studies looking at uh, antibodies that may protect against COVID infection, in part because we were seeing our patients getting much sicker. And when you get enrolled in these studies, you're able to actually get uh, access to some of these innovations much ahead of, uh, of uh, other centers. Diagnostic studies. So there are a number of different studies ongoing now that where we, we measure in the blood or in the urine markers of rejection. So we can early diagnose a rejection after transplantation. And we also have access to interventional studies. So new rejection medications that are not available in the clinic, but with great potential where patients could potentially get involved and uh, enroll in order to get um, new treatments that are becoming available uh, to our kidney uh, population. We have uh, over 110 individuals working exclusively in transplant research uh, at MGH. So it's, it's a lot of people trying to advance and, and bring some of these innovations back to the clinic. And to finalize a few other things that I wanna highlight, so there are certain patients that have a kidney disease that may recur after transplantation. And MGH leads the largest consortium of kidney disease recurrence called Tango with over 38 centers. So this really allows us to, to be leading um, the, the field of kidney disease recurrence and portray, give um, opportunities for patients uh, to get the most outcome. We also have a unique uh, tolerance uh, trials that have been ongoing now for over 20 years. So these are trials where patients do not want to take any immune suppression. And the, the, the way to, to be able to do this is that they get a kidney and a bone marrow from the same donor transplanted. 
And this allows them to remove completely their immune suppression in the long term and be, uh, be free of any of the side effects of immune suppression. So some patients may choose to go down the track of tolerance trials. And there are a few things coming down the block. So MGH have been doing xenotransplant research for over 30 years. And finally, we're getting closer and closer to the clinic. Hopefully in the next year or two, we're gonna have our first patients transplanted with xeno. And this is important because we have a huge deficit of kidneys, unfortunately. So there's a, cl close to 100,000 patients on the waiting list waiting for a kidney, and we just don't have enough kidneys. And the xenotransplantation and all the advances that uh, have, have been done in the past um, uh, 20 years may permit us to actually have uh, uh, a kidney transplanted from a pig into humans. And this may, may uh, create a bridge for them until they get a human. And also we work uh, in partnership with the WIS Institute in the development of artificial kidneys. So instead of a pig, can we actually recapitulate what the kidney does by growing them in vitro and then implanting? And here I'm showing you a picture of, of how these kidneys will look like. And uh, this is a little bit further, uh, um, not as advanced to be uh, transplanting to humans, but it's definitely something that it's moving along and hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to also offer that as a treatment option. Last year, uh, we completed 147 kidney transplants. So it's almost like one kidney transplant every other day. We have close to 1,300 patients on our waiting list and our survival are excellent, which is the most important part. 97% grass survival at uh, three years. And of course, this is not the work of one person. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a team and excellent really kind of takes a village. And I wanna just take a minute just to highlight, you know, all our, the team players that make this possible from uh, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, pathologists, uh, and so forth. And, and this is what really makes uh, our programs uh, so, so successful. So in summary, what I wanted to, to highlight is that it's really important for you to know your kidney function. You talk about cholesterol, you talk about other things, anemia, but your kidney function is as important. Ask your primary care doctor if you can check your blood creatinine and a urine test to tell you if your kidneys are, are working okay. Check your blood pressure and blood sugar annually. And this is very important to ensure that you stay with that under control as we know those are the leading causes of kidney disease in the long term. Hydrate yourself often. And in particular, when you start your day, drink that glass of water early in the morning, even before you hit uh, the coffee pot. And finally, avoid taking NSAIDs, non-steroid anti-inflammatory agents regularly, such as ibuprofen, Motrin, and Advil. And I'll stop here, and thank you again for, for joining and uh, for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Riala. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat, and I'm happy to moderate them. So we have a couple of questions regarding kidney health and kidney disease. Given that red meat is such a staple in the American diet, what does in moderation mean for someone with PH3 kidney disease? Yeah, so red meat would be, moderation would be say one serving a week. I think this would be a reasonable one. Uh, two, uh, I think would be kind of stretching a little bit, uh, but once a week. And of course, there's all these other options of protein-based, um, uh, plant-based proteins that are excellent, uh, as well as fish, and, and, and uh, white, uh, white uh, meat, chicken, and so forth. And those are all um, uh, good alternatives. Uh, but we really want to try to move away from you know, every day uh, or every other day uh, red meat eating. And you can you give us a summary or remind us of what a serving size looks like? A serving size, yes. Let me see if I have. Uh, uh, so I think the best, uh, the best example of a serving size it's probably this one here. Just uh, hide this. Let me just share this again. Um, here. So, you know, the palm of the hand. I think that's kind of a good, good idea of a kind of a serving size. Uh, and and you know, of course, it may change with uh, from patient to patient, but that's a good example of that. We do have as well um, yeah, a, a a chart of you know what's the kidney. Uh, kidney balance uh, diet plates uh, that we're happy uh, happy to share uh, with the group, and he has you know uh, some of these tips about you know 
the what's a serving size in terms of vegetables and fruits. We use the size of two fists as being, you know, what you you want to aim for uh, when you're kind of building your plate and whole grains, for example, size of a fist and so forth. We're happy to share some of that. Uh, and this is a, a MGH kind of based uh, nutritional plate that we had kind of developed for our, our, our kidney transplant patients. Thank you. Next question is, can you prevent kidney stones if you're at high risk due to kidney disease? Yeah, great question. So this is where the most data exists uh, in terms of hydration. Because kidney stones form when the, the, um, the urine gets saturated with crystals. So the, the more you drink, the more diluted your urine is going to be and the less chance of actually forming those crystals. So hydration is one of the key aspects of preventing kidney stones. And we know that if you're preventing kidney stones, you're not only preventing that big stone that may obstruct and cause pain, but it also may prevent uh, from small stones getting deposited on the kidney, causing inflammation and scarring. And then uh, and when somebody has recurrent stones, we also tend to advise them to run a 24-hour urine test where they collect the urine for 24 hours and then they measure many of the compounds of that urine to see if there's anything that make them more predisposed of developing stones. And there's not only one type of stone, there are multiple types. So this is important as well. But if you ask me, give me one advice about kidney stones, drink as much water as you can. The more diluted your urine is, the less likely it is to develop kidney stones. Thank you. Why is the kidney one of the few organs that cannot be repaired? Good question. Well, I think the, 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 the one that has the biggest regeneration is the liver. Uh, I think all the other organs, unfortunately, they, they are much less likely to, re, uh, to be able to repair. There's some repair that happens, and, but the biggest problem is on the filter. So when the filter gets damaged, uh, it's such a delicate and intricate structure that um, it, causes, uh, it causes the scarring there. And unfortunately, it's very hard to reverse. So reversibility of kidney function is really hard, but there are of course things that you can do such as controlling your blood pressure. So that's less pressure going through those kidney filters that can prevent further damage or say controlling better your blood sugars so that that blood sugar is not plugging and obstructing that filter over time. So these are things that, um, that can be done, but unfortunately, yes. Regeneration is not a is not a future of the kid. Thank you. Then we have some transplantation questions. Of course. First question is: Can you tell us a little bit more about transplants in the age of patients, including how does age factor into the equation of one's placement on the transplant list? Yeah. So we tend to not look at the chronological age, but the biological age. We know that frail patients, so patients that uh, very weak, that uh, have a limited mobility. They, they uh, similar to having uh, those, um, those weakness on the muscle side, they also have a lot of a very little reserve to undergo a big surgery. So th it is very possible that we have someone uh, on their uh, about six years old that, that looks very frail, weak. And, and these are patients where sometimes going through a big surgery would actually put them on a on a much higher risk category. And at the end of transplant, they're gonna be in a worse condition than they were prior to transplant. So we tend to assess everyone um, very carefully and, and, and make that individualized decision. Uh, I think a very important aspect is that, you know, we, we have transplanted patients up to 80 years old. The problem is if, if somebody comes to the list and they're 80 and they don't have a living donor and they have to wait four or five years to get a transplant uh, on the waiting list, it's very unlikely for them to get a kidney at that point because five years with advanced kidney disease, their health is probably going to continue and likely is going to continue to deteriorate and they won't become um, a candidate at, after that, that time. So uh, the living donor is really the biggest option that provides us, uh, if a patient can go through the surgery, provides them the best chance of uh, being um, transplanted safely and ultimately you know, benefit the most from the, from the kidney transplant. Thank you. Is transplantation the only answer? How about stem cell and other innovative procedures? Yeah, great question. So when you get to that stage, when, when your kidney function or GFR that we mentioned is close to 15 or 10, it's very unlikely for us to be able to 
recuperate kidney function. So when we talk about transplant, we're talking about that very advanced stage of kidney disease. Before that, you know, if you go to the GFR of 60, between say 30 and 60, there are a lot of potential treatments, uh, mostly involving medications that have shown a clear benefit in slowing the progression. So all our kidney function will go down over time, but the question is, is it going sharply down or can we slow down and prolong the life of the kidneys as much as we can? So there are only being medications that have shown to be able to do that slow down. Of course, depends on the, the type of kidney disease, what caused the kidney disease for us to discuss specifically. But uh, so far, there has been no, no study showing that stem cells can regenerate the kidney or improve the kidney function. There are some ongoing studies uh, looking at that, uh, but so far, there's nothing that had been published uh, that I can tell you for sure, this is the way to go and this will benefit patients. Thank you. Regarding living donors, is there an age limit on who can be a living donor? Great question. I think similar to uh, what the, we describe on the, on the recipient side, on, on the transplant candidates, we don't have a, um, a, a cutting uh, age limit to say you're not a donor. But of course, uh, we have a separate team that assess the donor and they have a very high bar, meaning they go through all their health, make sure that there's nothing at risk uh, that will put the patient at risk for donating and, and then they assess. Uh, so we had seen uh, patients donating at the age of 70 and, uh, and healthy 70, of course. Uh, but if somebody has, for example, diabetes uh, or have had high blood pressure for many years and their kidney function is not great, these are patients that unfortunately are not considered good, good candidates. But I would advise on the error on the side of if you have a loved one or someone in the family that you're interested in donating, you don't know if your age is a limit or not. What we advise is to just apply for it uh, through the donor program. And uh, there's, a, there's a website we're happy to share. It's called mghlivingdonors.org. And you can include a little bit, some basic information and the team will review and then get back to you. And remembering that donation is something that, you know, does, if you start the process, it doesn't mean that, that, uh, that you're forced to complete it. It is something voluntary. You can drop out at any, any point. Most patients drop out because of medical reasons. So there's no, there, there's no pressure or anything like that. They can always, uh, you know, hear more about it, join. And we have a monthly webinar uh, that talks about how to find a living donor and what are some of the stigmas that, uh, that we've seen. And there are actually pairs of patients and donors that join these webinars and they talk about their own experience, ways that they, they uh, were, what they experienced, how did they reach out and find a donor and other strategies that patients can decide what, what works for them. There's no one formula. And so this is what we wanted to just share uh, as a group uh, to our patients. Thank you. If a person has a fully blocked kidney artery, are they eligible to donate a kidney? If they have a fully blocked kidney artery? Yeah, I think it's better in these specific cases, I'll, 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 we can maybe discuss offline uh, so we can better understand the details. How are non-directed living donor kidneys allocated? Are some people more likely to receive one? So which kidney, sorry? Non-directed living donor kidneys. Uh, great. So, uh, so these are what we call altruistic donors. Um, so we are part of a, a big registry called National Kidney Registry. And uh, many of these altruistic donors go to this registry. And this allows uh, a lot of the kidney swaps to happen. So about one third of all our living donors are swaps, meaning, you know, say, I want to get a transplant. My loved one is going to donate. It was supposed to donate to me, but we are incompatible. So instead of us saying, no, if you're incompatible, you're going to have to wait on the waiting list. What we can do is include, say, my wife into, uh, into this National Kidney Registry. And then there are going to be other pairs there that uh, may be on the similar situation. And then I can get a kidney that may be compatible to me. And then my loved one will donate um, to someone on this registry. And so what, whenever we have these altruistic donors, we tend to, to donate to the registry and then the registry re redistributes so that you can start a chain, what we call, which is you know, a sequence of, of exchanges of kidney, maximizing 
you know, the potential benefits um, uh, for our patients. Thank you. On average, how long does a new kidney last? So if you get a kidney transplant, um, uh, deceased donor kidney tends to last between eight to 10 years. In some cases, it may go up to 30, 40, but in average, that's what we see. And then for, for the living donor, it tends to last between around 12 years. And those are not fixed numbers. So, you know, again, there's, it's just a, an average and majority of the patients, especially older patients, they're not gonna die because their kidney failed. They're gonna die because of other reasons uh, other than the kidney. So this is important as we think about, you know, the benefits of uh, kidney transplantation. Are there any vascular benefits to transplant a kidney by taking low-dose aspirin? So low-dose aspirin. So low-dose aspirin in general, um, it's, not, it's not like a, a, a prevention strategy for kidney disease. I think, uh, you know, if you have, if you had a prior heart attack, um, this is where, you know, having an aspirin may help or some patients that may have some clotting tendencies. So they tend tendency to form clots in their body uh, where there might be an indication for a blood thinner like aspirin is indicated, but in general, aspirin is not a, a treatment that we tend to use uh, uh, for kidney disease. Yeah. If dialysis survival is comparable to cancer, why is there a standard wait of three years for transplantation for patients who are in cancer remission? So um, the three years uh, is, is not something that we use um, uh, for, uh, in terms of waiting time for cancer. So it all depends on the type of cancer. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two examples. So if somebody had a prostate cancer, they, they went in, they got the surgery done, and got the prostate removed, there was no evidence of cancer anywhere else, we would not wait to, get the, to do the kidney transplant. We would move right away. Some other cancers, uh, we wanna wait between one or two years. And the reason is that if the, if the cancer comes back, when we are doing the transplant, we're weakening our immune system. And now we know that the immune system fights against the cancer and eliminates the cancer. So if you're weakening the immune system, then you're kind of making your body less prone to fight that cancer. So we give that window period just to make sure that that cancer is not coming back and that we are not causing more harm by giving you the transplant and allowing that cancer to grow. So we, we tend to assess every patient, again, every situation is very specific, but we do not use like a specific cutoff. Uh, some cancers, we have no waiting time and some cancers, we may have a short waiting time. Uh, and then some cancers, such as bloodborne cancers, we may recommend getting a bone marrow and a kidney transplant at the same time. And this is uh, what well, we are only a few centers in the country that, that does this. Uh, multiple myeloma, you get a, a bone marrow and a kidney transplant at the same time if you're a good candidate. And that, that's one way of getting two treatments in one and, uh, and saving your kidney and, and resolving the multiple myeloma problem. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about kidney disease recurrence after transplantation? Yes. So recurrence of kidney disease after transplantation is the, the third leading cause uh, of, of kidney transplant loss. Um, there's a few specific diseases that tend to recur. Uh, there is a form of, um, that we call FSGS that tend to recur very early. There are a few other diseases that take time to recur such as membranous and IgA nephropathy. And there's some others that depend on complement uh, activation where your body kind of activates too much complement. And that can also happen, that recurrence happens very early on. We tend to do a very thorough assessment of our patients prior to transplant, including genetic testing in some of these patients to help us decide or, or at least help us risk stratify, okay, what is the risk of this coming back? And in some cases, we may decide of doing some treatments either before transplant or at the time of the transplant to minimize the risk of recurrence. So we are involved in a few different studies and we collect samples from patients on the research side in order for us to better understand the disease and, and better manage our patients. So we're making progress uh, and, um, and we, can, we can have probably another hour to discuss uh, some of these specific diseases and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk offline as well. Thank you. Can a transplanted patient eventually decrease or eliminate immunosuppression medications? 
So if they have not gone through a, a what we call tolerance protocol when they get the bone marrow and kidney transplantation, uh, they always going to have to uh, to be on immune suppression. And and we have now studies that we have uh, participated in the in the past ten years where we got very low risk patients, patients that had been transplanted for say five, ten years. They were stable. They got a very good match kidney. And we attempted to lower the immune suppression. And there's a threshold. After a certain number, if you lower further, they start rejecting. And actually, the study had to be stopped early because more than 50% of the patients that started to get their doses of immune suppression down ended up rejecting. So the only scenario, the two scenarios where you can stop immune suppression or not require immune suppression in the long term, one is if you get the bone marrow and the kidney transplant together from the same donor. That's one. The second one, if you have a, a twin, an identical twin that donates a kidney to you, and these, this is where you know that kidney that comes with a fingerprint, now it's exactly the same as yours. So in these cases, we, we are able to actually just give you a little bit of medication early on to reduce the inflammation, but these patients do not require long-term um, anti-rejection meds. Unfortunately, all the others, they come with their own kind of fingerprint, those kidneys, and your immune system is able to recognize that as being foreign and start attacking the kidney. So we need some good dose of immune suppression to keep it. We do lower, if you compare at the first year compared to say the second year, we are able to reduce that immune suppression, but never completely stop. So I think we have time for one more question. How far off do you envision the generation of artificial kidneys grown from stem cells be available for patients to use? Yeah, so for stem cells, I, I think it's still going to take another five to 10 years uh, to be something that would get to the clinic. Uh, I think there has been a lot of progress, uh, a lot of excitement uh, in the area. But as, as you know, you know, for a treatment to get to patients, there's all these steps that ha we have to go through, uh, including in the FDA. So I feel that to be a, a fully functional kidney that's going to substitute I say dialysis, I think that part is going to take a few years to still for us to get close to that. But, uh, but it's, there's a lot of development in the area and a lot of exciting um, new discoveries. So hopefully that will be accelerated. But realistically, uh, I think that's a reasonable kind of timeline. Thank you. Before we end today's session, Dr. Riel, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? No. The, well, I'll say that kidney disease, you know, it's, it's a really tough disease. And, and we, we as a team, uh, we are here to support uh, you or a loved one and, and in any way we can to help you navigate through that journey. So uh, my, my only thoughts is, you know, you're not alone uh, and, and uh, please, please reach out and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, things will, will work out and, uh, and we'll be happy to help you in any way we can. Thank you so much. And for everyone who took the time to join us, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully you found today's session helpful. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. It'll be made available on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have Thank a lovely rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.